Until now, I've made a little bit more than 30 brain bit by bit flaps showing neuroradiological findings in different brain diseases. And I've only talked about the brain without mentioning anything about the mind. So I felt it was time for an intermezzo to share my personal view and to look back at the things we've discussed and add a little bit. And I have called this vlog Images and Imagination. And when I was studying medicine in Montreal, there was an exhibition by a French photographer named Jan Arthus Bertrand, who took pictures of the earth from above, from different parts of the world. And I really liked these pictures and this exhibition because sometimes you had to look twice to see what you were looking at. This is not a collection of cauliflowers, but if you notice the man, you can see that he is lying on bales of cotton. And these colorful stripes are the flower fields in Holland. And I have the same feeling when looking at these pictures of cotton bales going to the cotton plant in my mind as I have with MR images. Because like the photographer is sitting in his helicopter or airplane taking pictures of the earth from above, with the MRI you are taking pictures of the brain at a macroscopic scale. You do not see the individual neurons. And there are about 50 to 80,000 neurons per square millimeter of neocortex in the brain. And the pathologist, he is inside the flower fields and he can see the different neurons that are each 3 to 80 micrometers sized. And with electron microscopy and with stochastic optical resolution microscopy that came up in the beginning of the millennium, you can see even more detail, such as the cell structure. So as a radiologist, we are in the helicopter or the airplane having an overview, and we need to have contact with the people on the ground with the pathologists, with the psychiatrists, with the neurologist to inform us what is going on, on down there. The first vlogs were about patients with epilepsy with cortical malformations and I repeatedly named proliferation, migration and organization. There is not only radial migration of neurons, but also tangential migration. And during tangential migration, the neuron gets exposed to different molecular environments, increasing the phenotypical variation. And this is important because if you have cells with different phenotypical variation in each region of your brain, you have more potential. So this is when the potential of your brain is established. Not the outcome, but the potential. I showed pictures of focal cortical dysplasia type 2, a problem with the proliferation and the stem cells, with clear imaging findings with hyperintensity all the way from the ventricle to the cortex, with blurring of the gray white matter interface. And there were different glutamate receptors making this disease less responsive to anti-epileptic drugs. Focal cortical dysplasia type 1 is a much more subtle disease that happens during the organization of the cortex, where the neurons do not let go of their radial glial cell and are therefore radially arranged. And FCD type 1 is much more difficult or even impossible to detect on imaging. It's also much more difficult to do successful surgery in patients with FCD type 1 than in patients with FCD type 2 because 
FCD type 1 is difficult to delineate and you do not know where you have to stop. And if you see FCD type 2 and FCD type 1 as a spectrum, you can imagine that the psychiatric or the mental disease are also in this spectrum, maybe with normal neurons, but with abnormal function, maybe with problems at the level of the synapses, but in any case, something that you cannot not see from the earth, but from above, but where you have to be on the ground to know what is happening. I showed pictures of the limbic system, which is always slightly hyper intense on flare because it has such a high water content, because it is an old evolutionary system. I showed pictures of hippocampal sclerosis in patients with epilepsy and I mentioned that encephalitis of the limbic system is caused by old viruses like herpes. There is also sometimes enlargement of the amygdala in patients with epilepsy and I wondered if there was an analogy with the hypertrophic olivary degeneration. The hippocampus is important in learning and memory. And this is an electron microscopic image with a scale of 0.5 micrometers of CA1 in a red hippocampus. And you can see in brown the presynaptic neuron, the exon. You might remember that on the dendrites drawn here by Ramonica Kral are dendritic spines. So the yellow is a part of the dendrite and green is the dendritic spine. And in blue are some glial cells. And whatever what happens when you learn something is that the reaction of the postsynaptic neuron to the presynaptic stimulus changes. So the things people tell you change the reaction of the postsynaptic neuron. And Psychoeducation is useful in patients with mental diseases because you can truly influence synaptic responses in your brain. Psychiatric disorders are difficult because the neural mechanisms remain unclear as was stated in Radiology 2016. And this was an overview article about psychoradiology and in the appendix was a large list of imaging findings in different psychiatric diseases. And the author stated that in the future there might be an imaging-based nosology for psychiatric disease. It is hopeful, but I do not know if it is completely true. When you look at neurodegenerative diseases, Alzheimer's disease and frontotemporal dementia are seen by a psychiatrist where I work, whereas Parkinson's disease goes to the neurologist. And I also mentioned that the dopaminergic neurons that get lost in Parkinson's disease in the substantia nigra have the same origin and are contiguous with the dopaminergic neurons in the ventral tegmental area that connects to the limbic system. I also showed several posterior fossa malformations, also discussing the embryology and the neurotransmitters in detail, and then the Walker malformation and Blake's pouch cyst might look alike if you do not know anything about the background. They're both cysts in the posterior fossa with very different neurodevelopmental outcomes. And if you know the embryology and if you know what happens and happens at the molecular level and at the cell level, if you know what happened on the ground, you can make the difference. So I do not agree completely that we can make an imaging-based 
nosology of psychiatric syndromes. As radiologists, we do need people on the ground to inform us what is going on. And the most recent vlogs were about the meninges and perivascular spaces, and I've shown different inflammatory and infectious brain diseases in patients with HIV to illustrate that the glymphatic system and the CSF is important for the brain homeostasis and that our brain is not just neurons and synapses but that there's also a CSF and a lot of glial cells that make this system work and I would like to continue with going into more detail on HIV and cephalopathy, illustrating the role of microglial cells, progressive multifocal like encephalopathy, talking about the oligodendrocytes, and then continue with iris, the new Moche entity in the classification by the International League Against Epilepsy, multiple sclerosis and more white matter diseases. Thanks for watching and I do hope you will stay tuned.